Hey guys, I'm Anand Shimpi from Anantech.com. This is our first. This is something we've never done before. This is the Anantech Mobile Show. I'm joined by the ever awesome Brian Klug, our senior smartphone editor. Hey guys. Um, so you're used to us doing this in podcast format. Um, canonically, I guess this would be episode 20 something, um, but this is number one in terms of the mobile show. So there's like a whole bunch of stuff that we have been kind of putting off talking about because we thought we might be able to do this here. We're live from IDF uh, 2013. We're Moscone West, yeah. second floor. There's like a whole bunch of stuff going on here. Um, and there's just a bunch of stuff that we haven't updated you on. So uh, I just want to dive into it. Yeah, it has yeah. been a while. Um, so we'll go a little bit out of order. Yeah. Uh, you and I flew in on Monday. That's right. 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 We flew in on Monday. We, I, I rented a car, grabbed him from the airport, and then we drove straight to Intel in Santa Clara. And uh, we just started working on Bay Trail. Bay Trail. Um, so the way it worked is Intel brought us in. They did. Uh, they had some slides going on about like you know the current state of Android benchmarking. It's something we've often complained about. Yeah. I think um, the whole the whole industry identifies this problem now. Exactly, and, it's kind of frustrating, right? Because like we we've been saying this a lot. A lot of the the companies, they'll all do their little spiel about how much we right. need Android benchmarking, but there's no good solution, and we're not the people that need to be talked yeah, to about it. I feel like we've we spent a lot of time and effort explaining that problem, and yeah. I guess it's good that everybody's getting a, a redundant education about it, but. Yeah. It is, it is kind of like the problem needs to be solved by the people that can solve the problem yeah. rather, than, rather than us because we can't write the benchmarks necessarily yeah. and get everybody to agree on them. Um, so yeah, but everybody so, has to do their little thing. So we did that um, and then they took us on a tour of their, uh, I guess their experience lab. Yeah, testing right? lab. So they had this like crazy robotic arm that they send commands to and, and that's how they simulate like user experience on uh, on like tablets and phones and stuff like that. And they've got like an insane red camera videotaping it all. Yep. Um, and then they just do like all this analysis on it. And, and that's how they determine, you know, whether or not a device, like how they quantify whether or not a device has a good user experience. Uh, that was cool to see because I think a lot of, a lot of companies also still struggle with yes. how, do we, how do we codify you know, what is the performance of this device versus the other device? What tuning yeah, do we like, have? because what we normally see is like you can get a great Sunspider score and then just drop frames everywhere. Right. Right, because they're, they're, they are orthogonal, right? Like those two things have nothing to Very do with Very much. And I, it's, a lar it's a larger extension of the, the problem that they kind of pitch. Yeah. Which is that the benchmarking isn't tracking well with, you know, user experience and user performance. Yeah. So we need to resort to these things that sort of interact with the display and emulate a user. Yeah. And... It's so, cool to see. I mean, they've shown it before, but I had never seen it in person, and it's, yeah. it's good to see that somebody's actually doing that testing. Well, it's it's kind of interesting the way it works, right? They went out and they did all these like focus groups first, just to get an idea for what people thought was a good experience versus a bad experience, and they like they tabulate all this data. They've got all this stuff. Then they kind of derive mathematical models from all of it, right? So they don't have to keep surveying right. the same people. Like, do you like this tablet or do you not? So they take all that data. Uh, and then they have this kind of robotic arm plus camera setup to you know simulate usage, and then based on what the camera sees, they map it to that original data, and yep. that's how they can say you know on a, a tablet that comes out next year whether or not that original focus group of people and that group gets updated regularly yeah. whether or not they would have thought this is a good experience. So it's kind of a neat idea, but the the thing we challenge them on is you know it's and great you guys get this, but can you get the OEMs in here to also do it? Because that seems to be I weak think, link. I, I think coming up with a moss like that, and it's it's an empirical moss that they have, yeah. is great. Mean opinion, mean opinion, mean opinion score. score. Uh, it's great, but at the same time, you know you really do need to make sure you're getting actual user studies and yes. actual stuff done. And predicting is one thing. It's whether it's actionable data, yeah. you know, is, is going to be something else. Well, yeah, and I think it's the... great for them to make their own performance predictions, but it's it's. I'm not really convinced yet that it's a, it's at the point where an OEM is going to turn around and say, okay, we're going to go back and fix this. Yeah. You know, they don't have the. I mean, you said this as well. They need yeah. a bigger carrot or a bigger stick. Yeah, absolutely. No, I see. I, I think the the OEM angle is always difficult, right? Because it's it's uh, a lot of them are still. They're learning. the customer. Yeah. But you also want to make sure that you know they're you're representing in, yeah. the platform properly. Well, what's intriguing to me is if you look at how microprocessors were designed for so long, yeah. you know, you would take spec, you would take these workloads, and you would use them to determine you know, how big your caches were, what your predictors looked like, all that yeah. kind of stuff. And this is the first time where it's like you have all of that and also humans, right? right? Yeah. Like these like groups of people that you, you surveyed and you've gotten information about, they are now kind of influencing the way chip architecture looks going forward. Right. So that's kind of mind blowing. Yeah, and, and, different. and it's kind of it's nerve wracking. Uh, and it's I mean they they kind of explained it, but are they naive users? Yeah. Are they also you know do they perceive the same things we do? Yeah. Because 
you know, we sort of know what to look for when, you know, like, are you dropping a frame? Are you janking? Yeah. Is the touch interaction smooth? Um, the things that sort of enthusiasts use to gauge performance versus yeah. things that people can't really put in, you explain, know, they don't know right? how to explain. So, I mean, obviously there's great statistical backing there, but yeah. I th obviously benchmarks aren't going away. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just that, so anyways, we did that, right? And then they shuffled us on to a bunch of other stuff, and then they were like, here, here's a really, really cold room. Yeah. Go in here, yeah. <laughs> and there's just there was like a litany of Bay Trail tablets, um, and you grabbed obviously you grabbed the Android one. Yes. I grabbed the I was stuck doing the Windows stuff. Yep, yep. <laughs> um, we sort of divided up that way. Yeah, yeah, and I there was one running Android 4.2.2, and then Windows 8. Point something. Yeah, and uh, yeah, the room was freezing, but uh, <laughs> so obviously the devices aren't going to throttle, which is yeah. good. But uh, yeah, I mean I I, li I like the format, and I like the idea that. They give us the same sort of access that you know Qualcomm does now. Yeah. Obviously, Nvidia is starting to do the same thing. Yep. It's interesting to see all these players sort of moving towards that model where they're going to bring us in to, to look at the reference design and sort of gauge that performance. Yeah. And then you know we get to have something to hold the OEMs accountable with. Yes. When the devices come back and maybe they don't meet that performance level, maybe they're not you know up to spec in terms of the thermals. Yeah. Um, so I, li I like that idea, and I'm glad that Intel is doing it. That's cool. So what did you? What was your? Uh, so on the Windows side, it was really interesting to me because I'm kind of stuck in this weird place in Windows today, where you know, do you compare to like all the legacy notebooks? Yeah. Right. And, and, yeah. and <laughs> right. What, what we saw with how Bay Trail performed, like we tested the highest end SKU. Right. Um, but it's like a $37 chip, and it was delivering performance that was kind of in the class of like a 2010 11-inch yes. MacBook. Yeah. Right? right. So that's on one end, that's really cool. And then on the other hand, there's also like this Windows tablet market, right? Yeah. Which, you know, isn't that developed right now. It's not, uh, like my comparison points over there just aren't very good, yeah, right? right. They're, they're kind of forgotten platforms. And it did really, really well there. Uh, the, obviously the lines are emerging everywhere and it's kind of the, yeah. the same thing that I, you know, even the, the data that we're gathering, it's kind of, we have this discussion internally about, does it go under tablet, does it go under phone? Yeah. And now. You know, we have devices that kind of straddle the line yeah. between a tablet and a phone. You know, like the phone pad, for example. Yeah. Is that a tablet or is it a phone? What do I compare it to? And, like, how do I minimize the yelling when, you know, you're making <laughs> comparisons against a tablet, but it's also a phone. Yeah. And it's interesting to see that desktop and notebook and that sort of clamshell market is moving the same way, where yeah. really it's sort of a, a part that competes against notebooks from a couple years ago, but it's also going to go in these other platforms where it's really going to be in like a phablet or yeah. you know it could even move down to a phone who knows well so that's there, there are a couple of points that i respond to there right like there's the one this idea that that phone and tablet are all that dissimilar yes um, you know if you look at the power we're talking about the same like I one or two watt yeah. you know range there for a lot of like normal work right um, now every now and then you have like the insanity right where you know it'll be like a 10 watt part in there <laughs> yeah, but, or but 12 watt yeah. or just like <laughs> but, but for the most part like it's I'm just constantly shocked. Like when we did the Nexus 7 stuff and I right. measured power on that and I was comparing it to phones and we're in the same realm of right. power consumption. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, ultimately it's a foam part. I mean, the thing that differentiates for me is really the thermals. Yeah. And of course you see these parts, everybody's up against a thermal wall. It's just the reality. Yeah. And so that, that's a big difference that often, I mean, you know this as well, but often everybody comes back to and points to and you know like you just have a bigger thermal mass that, yeah. that's going to heat up slower and so is it really fair you know you see them throttle faster and but otherwise i agree it's the same part ultimately yeah. it's the same silicon and, you know, and they, they do down even ways. with the thermal differences they tend to actually behave very very similar yeah i t yeah totally agree um but so that was I, I think for me at least on the windows side that was my big takeaway with baytrail in yeah. that the performance, I mean, obviously, we the just got done. The lines are so blurred, even you know what to do subconsciously, right? Yeah, well, there's that, but like, I just got done testing Ivy Ridge E, right? So, that's one nothing, extreme. But nothing yeah. Baytrail's gonna do is gonna be like, oh, this is really fast. But what, what kind of blew me away was the performance it was delivering at the, t at the like, power draw it was delivering, yeah. right? Because yeah. I had them hook up, yeah. um, like, adjacent to the room we were doing all this testing in, they had, like, all of these tablets power instrumented. So I said, hey, you know, can I can I get power consumption on the test that I'm running? They're like, yeah, sure. So like, I walk over yeah. and you know just fire up Cinebench, and you're talking about like yeah. two they had two and a half watts. Plus. Yeah, they had all yeah, that stuff. But if, and, yeah. if you look at what was going on, you were getting like two two and a half watts SOC power yeah. running like multi-threaded Cinebench yeah. at the same performance levels of like a 17 watt you know part from a couple years ago. 
It is crazy, yeah. That was kind of insane, right? So that was the big thing for me. It wasn't absolute performance, but it was perf per watt that kind of yeah. blew me away on the right. Windows side. Well, what about on Android? What did you... I mean, obviously, they didn't show the, the Android side documented with power, but I mean, it's the same platform, so yeah. you don't really need to see it. I think on Android, it's, it's interesting that the reality is that the port is kind of lagging behind. Yes. So the emphasis is still Windows. Yes. And obviously, that makes sense for Intel because they want to really leverage the fact that they're running Windows and they can do both. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm grateful that they showed it running Android, to yeah. be honest. Uh, and obviously, I, I have no doubt that their bring up is going to be as, the same quality as it was with Well, so uh, that was the kind of interesting thing in that, like, you and I were physically testing the same hardware. Yeah, it's the same box, yeah. There was not a, like, his tablet was identical to mine, it's just it had a different OS load. Right. Which has a lot of really interesting implications for manufacturing these things. Right. Right? Whereas in, in the past, you know, you had, here's, here's your Android I line. I think that economy of scale is really going to kick into play and maybe will be a big value add yeah. for Intel. And if well, they, not can, only if that, they can do it the right way through their OEMs. Exactly. Well, not only just Intel, but the OEMs too, right? Yeah. Like having that flexibility where they can now, for the first time, they really have two viable OSs right. that they can ship on anything. And if you can do it on one unified platform. I, I mean, I'm totally sold on that. Yeah. I, I, think, I think for some applications, Android is still the canonical best thing to have. Yep. Uh, Obviously, like there's lines that are starting to blur between the two. It's great that it's not RT. I mean, obviously they yeah. don't have to do. They don't have to deal with that. Obviously, in the ARM space, they're kind of figuring that out. They could have done the same thing, you know, with OEMs that have a common platform that's sort of ported. Yeah. Uh, but I feel like it is more difficult there, and you know, Intel makes it a little bit easier with with their drivers and their BSP. Um, but I, I'm pleased with the Android performance. I, there were things with Dalvik, which we mentioned in the review that. You know, it's not dispatching the threads right yeah. right now. But, I mean, they're, they know these issues. They know that performance in UI in some places wasn't where it should be. Yeah. But obviously in the tests, it was great. You know, um, yeah, all the CPU takes advantage of x86. Good. All the CPU performance looked good. Uh, I really always go back to midfield because I spent so much time with uh, the X, uh, Lava Phone, the Zolo, yeah. you know, X900. I believe it was in the Orange San Diego and now Razer Eye. Yeah. And, you know, there's really no issue to speak of. Even in the, the very earliest time that I had that those devices, yeah. you really couldn't tell unless you looked for it that you were on x86. Yes. Which is really the big, the message, the big takeaway. Uh, at least it was then, and I think it still is now, and they kind of keep playing that up. Well, so for me, that was the, you know, can you use Android on x86 and have a decent experience? Right. I think that answered that, and, and then the question moved on to me, well, Okay, we'll can, this, can yeah. this modern, like, can yeah. this become a more modern platform? Right. Because right? if you look at when Medfield hit, it was really good at its time, right? right? On the CPU side and, and not good on the GPU yeah. side. And then you, you go forward and everything just got faster and Medfield stayed the same. Yeah. yeah. So then you get to Bay Trail and CPU performance, it's like you hit the reset button and, like, boom, they're at the top yes. now. Yeah. And you look at GPU performance and it's not at the bottom, it's not in the middle, but it's not at the very top. It's right. like kind of yeah. upper top middle area, right? Yeah. I, I think the GPU for us is a big thing that we're trying to push. Yeah. Especially because, you know, now in Android and obviously Windows from the beginning, there's GPU acceleration of 2D primitives yes. of the 2D UI. Um, so this is going to be a big, it's going to continue being a big thing and the 2D rendering pipeline isn't going to go away. Yeah. So having faster GPU directly translates to improved UI performance. And that's what I said in the article too. I was like, I want, you know, Intel has established leadership on the CPU side. Looks really, really good on power, at least competitive, right? right? We haven't done the competitive analysis, but you know, we're sure. talking one to two watts, one yeah. to two and a half watts, and yeah. a lot of heavy CPU workloads. I think that's fine. But I want to see that same leadership on the GPU side, yeah, right? Because that's ultimately what pushes the industry forward. Yeah, um, well, and imagination is gone. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, Major that's the other big yeah. thing, right? Like the you know evac of imagination technologies yeah. and, and moving right. into Gen Seven graphics. Um, I, I was actually kind and of they surprised. They showed that doing video too, which seemed. Yeah. To, yeah, I mean, those are the big questions for me, especially because some, you know, that's that's obviously the track going forward is yeah. something similar, and for it looked competitive the, the stuff that I saw. Yeah, I mean, obviously, like we got to wait for final hardware, then we can do our yeah, own like kind right. of power level comparisons. Got to compare like to eighty nine seventy four to absolutely Snapdragon eight hundred. Yeah. it's it's uh, we have our work cut out for ourselves, but I, I thought it was a good event. I thought it was like a good start. Yeah. Now, so we did that on day zero, and yeah, then that, day that one. That was like a whole day too. Yeah. It wasn't like ten minutes. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was yeah. We even like we kept people late, right? Like yeah, everyone yeah, had did. left we Intel, did. and then it was us and like people waiting to eat. Yeah, and that's then right. they were just kind of like, "When are you I guys?" I like the anechoic chamber too. They they seem to be wanting to do audio testing and yeah. that sort of thing, but it's just a cool excuse to step into an anechoic chamber. 
<laughs> so hemi, we did that. We did that on day zero, um, and then you and I drove to Cupertino yep. the next day, and we did the Apple event. Uh huh. Um, yeah, that morning, bright and early. <laughs> <laughs> and then what was your? So that was your first. Um, uh, that was both of our first experience at Town Hall, right? Normally yeah. they do it like out here in like a huge yeah, venue. Yeah, normally it's like right across the street, oh, essentially. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Like, so I, I did appreciate that it was more intimate. Like when Tim Cook it gets was. on stage, like I don't actually need to hear him on a mic. I can. I, can... I guess they renovated that space too. That's what somebody was saying. Oh, is that it's different and it's ready now, and they're going to use that more. Oh, interesting. Um, uh, you know, I, I think the performance. And we both ate apple omelets. Like I think yes, that's important. That's, a, that's critical. <laughs> yeah, very critical. You know. Food selection is always something you need to comment on. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I thought the event went well. They kind of stick to the same formula that they yes. always do. Obviously, Tim Cook, you know, is well rehearsed in the ways of Steve Jobs. Yeah. And, you know, like, started giving that update and then continuing on. You know, I think the iPhone announcements are great to have standing on their own. And I'm, yeah. I'm glad they did that because if they, if obviously, there's the October event. And if you throw too many things in at once, then it's kind of like it gets lost in the noise. And you know, like last time they had the iPods. Yeah. This time, I feel like you know, iPhone and two iPhones yeah. is enough on its own. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. I, my thoughts about the iPhone are still kind of like solidifying to yeah. some extent. And it's always difficult because when you're there, it's different from if you're like at 10,000 feet and you can see the broad picture. Absolutely. Like like you would be if you were sitting at home. Yeah. Obviously, like S refreshes are getting more difficult for Apple to really sell because they've they've indirectly kind of you know put forth this narrative that specs don't matter. Which yeah. I mean, you know, our position on that is that is that it's just laughable. Yeah. And, but at the same time, they're they're obviously pushing the boundaries with things like 64-bit. Yeah, know, no, no, I mean, it was a, for for you know we left. And, and I remember, you know, a year ago, right? We we're here. We we left Yerba Buena, and yeah. both you and I were like, "Hey, that's kind of an amazing announcement, right?" And it yeah. was we went contrary to what a lot of people believe because it was amazing to us since they, you know, built their own CPU architecture, did all this other yes. stuff, yeah. and that's what kind of blew us away. And and I remember leaving Town Hall and thinking, I just want to understand the chip architecture, right? Like that's that's, that's what the I'm big thing. that's yeah. what I'm drawn to here. I um, think. I think that that's the real magic of the S updates. Although I, I kind of expected more on the connectivity side, to be honest. Even yeah. If, you know, some of it isn't you know really possible. Like you can argue back and forth about. So what do you want? You want LTE advanced, and you want an yeah, 802.11 well, AC. Yeah, I was expecting the new modem. I think there's there's stuff back and forth about whether the new modem is ready or not. Yeah. Uh, carrier aggregation is going to be here in the next you know couple months. Yeah. Six months. So take people through way. like what is carrier aggregation and why does that matter? So in the United States, you can't have 20 megahertz. Nobody really has 20 megahertz of continuous spectrum, which yeah. is what the maximum single bandwidth channel bandwidth for LTE is, and that enables 150 megabits if you have a Category Four modem. At present, everything is Category Three, yeah. except for 8974, which is just coming out, which is limited to 100 megabits. So in order to realize the 150 megabit speeds, you need this 20 megahertz that really only Verizon has on band four. Okay. So to do this, like AT&T and uh, Verizon and else. most markets yeah. and everybody else that doesn't have that sort of contiguous spectrum is going to do aggregation of just basically two 10 megahertz slices of spectrum. Yeah. So if you have if you have two different bands, you you own you physically own enough spectrum. It's just they're not. It's not just it's in not one band. It's not contiguous in a nice place, and yeah. they can be on different bands. They can be in the same band somewhere. Okay. Uh, there are combinations that are published that 3GPP has approved. Okay. And essentially, the the cool thing about the new modem is that you can do these. Yeah. And I mean, they're on they're on AT and T's roadmap. They're on Verizon's roadmap. Yeah. And they're they're coming. But so, so so a lot of end users, if you look at LTE performance today, a lot of end users never get close to like 100, much less 150. So what is sure. the what's well, the real the world thing impact? Is, the thing is that it's not it's not total throughput because yeah. obviously you're never going to realize those. Yeah. It's that you know using that capacity efficiently. Okay. Is the same problem, and again, the race to, you know, faster really means lower power. Okay. Because it's not your in the short term, your your workload and your duty cycle isn't going to just go up all of a sudden. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which again is a philosophical argument, but empirically it just doesn't happen yeah, yeah. like that. So really, you get lower power. This yeah. is like the AC thing. Like, why do I need 433 megabits in a phone? I got you. So that's that's the other half of the argument, right? You don't have LTA, and and you'd like that yeah. for for you know better spectral efficiency and and better. Um, uh, just power efficiency. And plus, it's an S update. I mean, you you gotta have something. Yeah. You know? But then, so the same reason. That's why. Because I, I was actually thinking about this internally. I was thinking, 
I like that 802.11ac, it's on the One, it's on the Galaxy yeah, S4. Yeah, it's ubiquitous. It's on the Moto X. It's but on... it's never something that I benefit from directly in terms of peak throughput. But right. there's huh. the power efficiency argument. Sure. And is that is that the main thing you're looking for? That is that is one of the big things, yeah. And use, I mean, obviously, using more, more spectrum on 5 gigahertz, yeah. these wider channels. Um, it's all sort of the same problem, really. And I don't think there aren't there aren't any power disadvantages with going four th four three three five versus yeah. four three three four that I'm aware of. So I really think it's just kind of a volume play. Like if they can share that same part, that same inventory between the five C and the five S, that's kind of a well we can make the argument for getting better pricing that way. Yeah. And same with the obviously the modem stack is shared between the two. Yeah. Um, which they've said publicly. Then really that becomes the same thing, and it's both lower cost. To both support from the software side, yeah. which is like sort of a cost that nobody really factors in. They just look at what's the price of one discrete part yeah. versus what's the cost for maintaining it. So I mean, Apple has kind of been putting that forward. They want to maintain just one one software stack for the modem, yeah. one software stack for the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and oh, okay. so obviously this is this is sort of the result of that. You yeah. know, is that making it more economical? Unfortunately, means that, like you're gonna either gonna have to bring a more expensive product into the lower end or a, a less expensive, you know, maybe not flagship device into the high end. Yeah. And I think that's what you really see here, to be honest. Is so thoughts on the 5C, like as we're talking about volume and cost and all this, yeah. um, you played around with both of them quite a bit. Yeah. What, what do you think about the, the 5C? I, I think it feels great. Obviously the build quality is awesome. Yeah. And a lot of people are going to be, <laughs> are going to come back and say, well, it's a plastic phone, how can it possibly feel awesome? Yeah. Because you've been a huge proponent of like I need I need yeah, metal. I still want all metal. Obviously, Apple still doesn't have all metal. They have yeah. very close. The thing is that you know you, how do you maintain your rigidity while still having this plastic material, you know, or a polymer if we're going to use the, you know, the the buzzword <laughs> that that's a little bit less. Uh, it has fewer things attached to it. Than yeah, than plastic. Plastic. So I think it's all in the, the feel, how you deliver it. They have like the same metal structure inside. Yeah. So that really helps with the rigidity and making it feel solid. It has the same dimensions. I like the edge bevels. Yeah. Um, it does feel like really comfortable. OK, sorry about that. Um, apparently, we had a uh, wireless transmitter die, you know, battery life. It's like yep. it's always an issue. <laughs> Everybody with us. suffers from battery <laughs> life issues. <laughs> so we were talking about um, iPhone 5 feeling very tall. Yes, yeah. Um, and. They you need know, to I, move into different size factors, but I, I feel like they know that it's just too soon. You yeah, know, they no, can't. it's clear. Like they have this like this cadence of you have, you know, new chassis, keep it around for two generations, yeah. and then new chassis. So I, I think the prime time to do a larger display is next gen, right? Yeah, me too. I think the other thing is that you know iOS is kind of stuck with these different scalings. Um, I, it's the real question: is will will the development ecosystem change to support interpolation? Yeah. Will they stick to these scalings? Well, you know, rather than going at two x, will they do something else? Yeah, they have and to. I mean, I, do you I, scale up and then just call the iPhone, you know, like at this larger size, still Retina ish? Yeah. You know, and well, so I appreciate the results of the 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 two x resolution scaling. Yeah, me it too. Means we get insane GPUs and just yes. like they just have to throw more hardware at the problem, which I think yeah. is really cool. Well, and I can't see the pixels. I mean, it it, it really does make a substantial difference, yeah. at least to me. I don't know. So do you think so? Next gen, maybe they they do a larger display. And I then think they I think they have to. That, yeah. The scaling. Um, so we also recently got another, or not that recent. We got another device. Yeah. That, I mean, it's been a while, but we haven't talked about yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. So Moto X, um, both of us got one. Yep. Um, and I think we have three all total now. Yeah. Because so there's the black one that they and Motorola did an awesome job by sampling really early. Absolutely. So. Yeah, most Obviously, companies don't yeah. really do like I mean, like Intel. We're we're kind of spoiled on the PC side, right? Because yeah. we'll get something a month early. Well, and I'm really jealous of that because obviously <laughs> they they want sound testing. They want people to come back, you know, and, and review the device well, not yeah. necessarily like give it a good review, yeah. but really do a good job, yeah. you know, exploring it. Whereas normally for you, it's like someone throws a phone at you, and then it's like the I, I have like days. a week of which of which half is eaten up by battery life testing. Yeah, and then it's kind of like well. You know, you don't really get to enjoy the device or like use it yeah. and fit it into your daily schedule and see where, you know, what functions you're going to use really. Yeah. It's kind of a, well, I need to just go explore everything really fast yeah. and artificially, you know, come up with what, what I think is going to yeah. stick and what won't. Well, I find with all devices, there's like that one point where it kind of clicks. Yeah. And, and like right. I, I, I just get what the point is and, it, and what they It took try longer to do. with Moto X because. You know, I mean, we're going to talk about it, but the X8 system yeah. sort of was an initial turnoff, or at least the way it was presented to us and yeah. marketed. 
uh, well, because there's the like there's, thing you know, 20 years of, of how you reference microprocessor cores, right? CPU yeah. cores, how you deal with it. And then anytime someone, for marketing pur purely marketing purposes, yes. comes up and says, this is how we're going to do it, yeah. I, like uh, my initial, I'm just, I don't, I do your little hands up thing. And yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> there's nothing really, you, I was kind of surprised because I had been told, you know, rather early that they were going to go this way. Yeah. And my first reaction was, oh God, no, like, please can we not do this? <laughs> because like, it, it makes our job harder. Yeah. Because then, I mean, we, we're in a gigahertz race, but we're also in a core race. It's a core counting race, because it's not yeah. even like a real core race, right? It's Right, it's like things you can point out that are cores. So yeah. then, you know, like I wrote in the thing, at what point are we going to start counting like DSP cores as yeah, cores? Yeah, exactly, because you know? there are a bunch of those. Yeah, and so I said like it could be, you know, it could be 10 cores really yeah. in the Moto X. And some of these other phones, it could be like 12. I mean, NVIDIA, they could be in the 90s, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, like, what does it really mean? It doesn't yeah. mean anything. It's sort so, of a so more is better. So that initial thing turned us both off, right? It, re it really turned me off, yeah. But then we get the devices, and I know my initial reaction was I was like, actually, this is an amazing, like, size. For yeah. my hand, you know, I, I looked at, I like the HTC One a lot, right? But compared to that, the HTC One and the Galaxy S4, the Moto X was like the perfect size for me. Right. Um, now, I don't have the, like, yeah, the world's too. biggest hands. I, you know, I, I like the bigger devices, but I think this one fits really well. Yeah. And obviously, the customization option is novel. Yes. I don't know if it's the greatest thing in the world, but it does add something to, you know, the Motorola lineup that nobody else really has. Yeah. And sort of the interesting thing for me is that Google said their, their approach to designing the device was to sort of go and do a user study, yeah. find what what the right size of device is, yeah. get collect feedback, and then fit the device within those constraints. And I've always kind of wanted to, to see an OEM do something like that, yeah. or you know, instead study of just it like myself. arbitrarily saying, "Well, we need something bigger or smaller." And yeah, that's the engineering not how it works. process works the other way. And this is like top down. Usually, it's bottom up. Yeah, you know, and it's you know, these are the specs we need to have. How can we build? Yeah, a we device? need this display. You know, yeah. we've got all this stuff. We have this much area. Yeah. Fill the rest with battery. Yeah. And what you get is what you get. Whereas yeah. this is kind of like. Well, we we need a you know screen size that's this big maybe yeah. we want to go as big as we can probably yeah um, and then you need to fit the shape around it um, around this what we found is the best shape yeah so I mean to me I you know you have to give them respect where respect is due and yeah, absolutely I think that's the right way to do things it, it feels great obviously the the dual core part of it I think after a while it kind of clicked when you were like well because of the thermal reasons it kind of stays in the higher CPU states yeah. longer anyways yep. So maybe this really isn't actually stupid. Yeah, you know, no, maybe it makes sense. It's the only the only silly part about it isn't that it has two cores versus four. Yeah, is the amount of voltage you need to hit those higher frequencies. Yeah, that's the right. problem, right? If we were all having so a maybe rational eighty nine sixty Pro at HPM. Yeah, yeah, right. Like if we were having a rational discussion about look, we're only going to run at these frequencies of these voltages versus like right. over boosting to get there. Yeah, then I think they like then it would be a no trade offs kind of thing. Yeah, um, but that like that. When I looked at you know the scores they were getting on 3D Mark, and I'm like, yeah. why is this so high? Yeah. And then we just ran Trepin on it and saw that oh, it's just like yeah. the CPU cores just running way faster yes. right now. Yeah. Um, and so it, it kind of clicked, and and I almost don't I don't care that it's only a dual core at that point. Yeah. Um, right. I care that I miss it just... sometimes, but yeah, it's not it's not very often. I, I miss yeah. more of the fact that it's not 1080p. Do you? So um, I'm I'm actually. I, I just don't like AMOLED. I mean, you know where I stand okay. on that. No, no so I, I, but separate the two, right? Yeah. Like if it were an LCD 720p, it would look like the one mini, and I like I like the one mini in that size. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, the resolution I'm not totally bothered by, and you said it yourself. You're like technically this is like yeah, right in a class. Yeah, technically you can't see it. I just I just don't like AMOLED, and it seems yeah. like there there is something I can't really codify that I can see the pixels more in their domain. Interesting. You know, I think they have more black area around it. Yeah. Or something. The space fill isn't there. I'm not entirely sure what it is, but I mean, obviously to say nothing of the saturation, which yeah. on the Moto X, it's kind of like, did they even try? <laughs> you know, I mean, the charts are like, it's just off the, off, you know, it's like off scale high. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I like the device overall. I think it's great. I mean, I recommended it to people already. Yeah. No, I like the device a lot, and I like that it comes with like a, a mostly stock Android experience. Yeah, um, yeah, I don't know, it's not fully stock, but I mean, that's, that's probably the most positive thing to come out of the whole Google Motorola transition. Absolutely. Um, I mean, obviously, the Moto X is important to them, too, because this is literally, I mean, it's, it's all in the name, right? It's Moto <laughs> X. This is yeah. literally with a phone that's relaunching that company yeah. under Google leadership. No, I, I came away surprisingly positive on it, right? It's, yeah. My biggest issue with the Moto X is that I feel like in six to eight months, I'm going to feel like it's old, right? Yeah, that's that the thing. Is, well, it already kind of feels old. We have 8974 phones yeah. right now. And... 
You know, that's sort of the problem is it's not like, do the specs matter right now? Because yeah. right now it's just one slice in time. Yeah. Do they matter over this long integration of, you know, the year or two years, if yep. you're going to stick to your contract, that you're sort of sitting with this thing? And meanwhile, this ecosystem is moving so fast. Yeah. Are you going to really get left behind if you buy something like this right now? Yeah. Where already it's not a flagship. And, and obviously the, the pricing is the other thing for me is that yes. it's kind of like, it is a it is a high end but it's not premium level SOC yeah. in a device that's being sold at you know that sort of premium level cost. Absolutely. And, and I, then one there's of the also the camera stuff too, right? Yeah, yeah. The, well, it, it's really the unfortunate part of the Moto X is that I feel like the bomb is probably really high. Yeah. Because they spend a lot of money on camera, they spend a lot of money on the ISP, mm -hmm. they spend a lot you know, like they take the right boxes, uh, at least for the things that are around the SOC. But it, the result is like it's sort of cost too much. Yeah. You know. And it, it, like at sort of, 99, it would be it'd an be perfect. Amazing thing. Yeah, and they're gonna. I hope they go there fast. The rumors are they're gonna go there fast. Yeah. It, there is really there was one comment to that review that really stuck out at me, and it was like, "There's no such thing as a bad product, just bad pricing." Yeah, absolutely. And that's hilarious because literally, I remember through the years, it's like someone doing the that. Deal, someone know? doing <laughs> that comment, right? I remember yeah. seeing that in uh, I, around Larrabee. I remember seeing that around. Um, like some of our old GPU stuff. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's, it's the true. same commenter. Like that's just he's always just like he always drops in and is like, yeah, there's <laughs> just there, wisdom. Like, this isn't a bad device. It's just wrong price. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you can argue is the 5C too expensive? I, I mean, like it makes sense now that it's going to take the slot of yeah. the five. Uh, but I mean, uh, that's sort that seems to be like a recurring theme right now is that things are coming in at these price points that, you know, maybe they're trying to build the margin back up. Yeah, maybe you know, there's some uh, ulterior motive. I, I just feel like. The Moto X will move down really aggressively, yeah. and that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just kind of like it need maybe it needed to start high to have that flagship, that halo aura. Yeah, it's always frustrating to me because I, I think you said it in the review that if it came down in price, it would be almost disruptive in the marketplace. I think it would be, yeah. And and I agree with that. And the frustrating part is if you launch that way, then you yeah. launch to universally like awesome reviews. Right. Whereas if yeah. you launch high and like have to discount it, no one's going to go back and re-review yeah. that thing, right? You you have that. That's like a snapshot in time sure. that they've lost the the kind of opportunity to really capitalize yeah. on there. Well, then you can speculate too. Is that they don't want to they don't want to anger their their partners that are also delivering Android phones. That's true. And that that whole part of the Motorola equation that's sort of like there's a firewall in between. There's still Nexus. Yeah. We saw the Nexus leaks, yeah. which you know basically the FCC confirmed for us. Yeah. And. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's going on internal to Google that we don't really have visibility into. Yeah. And what the long-term Motorola Play is obviously wasn't just the Motorola X. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I think that device is interesting. Yeah. If nothing else, because again, it's stock. It has these features that I, I sort of like. I mean, you like. Yeah. I think they, they track well with normal people. I really like the the camera gesture. Like that. I, uh, I'm kind of addicted to that. I, I want I want to do this on. <laughs> <laughs> Although it takes pictures in my pocket all the time. Which is, like, <laughs> you and I must, like, walk differently? Because, like, I don't have... My gait is apparently just perfectly matched to the <laughs> camera gesture. Because literally, I pull it out of my pocket, and there's, like, it's the camera's on. So you're, like, did I put my did I put it in my pocket with the camera on? Yeah. And then you go into the gallery, and you just see pictures of your pocket. <laughs> which are always really surreal, because there's just, like, black and, like, random stuff, <laughs> yeah. you know? It just looks really strange. <laughs> so... Uh, you know, and those are two big features that they sort of highlighted, yeah. the, the active display and the camera activation yeah. thing. And, I mean, obviously they're going to be false positives. Yeah. But for me, at least, that's kind of a, it's a big detractor, but, yeah. you know, I realize not everybody's going to identify the same problem. Um, so we have time to talk about, real briefly, one last thing. Yeah. Um, so I went to New York, and I checked out uh, Galaxy Note 3. Galaxy Gear, um, and then the Galaxy Tab, or the Galaxy Note 10.1 2014 edition. Yep. Um, I feel like the most <laughs> interesting of all yeah. times, yeah. <laughs> I feel like the most interesting out of all of those, at least the most uh, topical one, is, yeah. is obviously Galaxy Gear. Yeah. Um, now, I haven't worn Qualcomm a watch in a long launched time. launched the talk at the same time. Yeah, exactly. Or announced it, I guess. And then you have Pebble Yeah, as well. I wear, well, I've been wearing Pebble daily for uh, since I got it, basically. Yeah. And, and I, you have glass as well. Yeah, I do, although I'm not wearing glass, obviously, right now. <laughs> I actually didn't bring it because... It's, sometimes it's hard to pack it, yeah. you know, it doesn't fold up. But it's obviously wearables are becoming a big thing right now. Even We even see Intel trying to move towards that, yeah. you know, with Quark. Uh, and I think it's interesting as a device maker, you know, we highlighted this in our article on the gear. Um, the reason this is happening now is because everyone who's kind of at the top of their game 
as they see smartphones moving towards like a more mature market, right, where you're not going to have this insane growth, obviously their shareholders, their investors, them as a company, they want to see that continued growth. Right. So it's really like, what can we do next, right, that's going to have that same curve so we can keep riding this wave. And I think yeah. wearables is, is an obvious fit, right? You leverage all the cell phone technology. Yes. Um, and you already know how to do low power, and then you just put it on something that goes on your face or right. neck or arm or whatever. I mean, this obviously that market has a long history. Yes. Going like back to the watch that ran, ran Palm, that you know the Meta Watch guy is now running. Yeah. So, I think it's interesting to see this. The point that you made that I really liked, and I think it's interesting to see it play out right now, is that both times when we kind of reached what we thought was saturation, yeah, this became the thing that everybody yep. was going to go to, to sort of keep the momentum going forwards. Yeah. And I think it's indicative that we're in that part of the cycle now. Yep. Which is well, kind of like part of my theory about like, are we nearing the end game or not? So the thing is, if you if you go back to the last time everyone tried to do wearables, yeah. right? So Samsung literally had a watch that looked like the Galaxy Gear. Yeah, I, right? I like that. You yeah. know, from whatever, 2008, 2009. Yeah. They were in that same kind of period where they're like, look, we want to keep growing the, the mobile business. Sure. And what ended up happening was there was a giant reset Right. on the entire yeah. mobile industry. Yeah. So the question is, does What's that happen again? Yeah. Or, or is this really like, does, does mobility just turn into what the PC industry was in let's say early 2000s, yeah. and now it's just maturity and perfection? I think it's too hard to say. Obviously you never know what's gonna come next. Yeah. I believe personally that there is starting to be a, like a plateau effect. There is always that question of where on the S-curve really are you? Yeah. Uh, I would say obviously it's indicative again that we're having wearables be a, a big discussion as a growth market, a growth. Yeah growth vector that that's sort of symptomatic of it. I don't know if it's really the the canonical cause. Yeah. Uh, personally I just I think it's fascinating that we're gonna get watches that kind of live up to the expectation yeah. that the previous set, you they know, just sort couldn't. of Yeah, they couldn't deliver. <laughs> I feel like the power, the process, yeah. the understanding, the smartphone experience is really there to deliver it. Um, is there my a way thoughts about that... Galaxy Gear notwithstanding, yeah. it's it's sort of looking like this is going to become another segment. Yeah. And, you know, my thoughts about Pebble are that it's still, it's sort of the earliest acceptable platform that you can really use. Yeah. When I got it, it was very early on. Uh, a lot of functions weren't fleshed out. I've seen UI changes. It's sort of settled down now. Yeah. I think Qualcomm Talk looks interesting, if nothing else, because of the mirror saw display. Yeah. Uh, I, I, like, even though I have, you know, some preconceived notions about Galaxy Gear, I still want to play with it. Yeah. I, I think battery life is the real concern there. Absolutely. Obviously, when you're below 24 hours, it's hard to sell a watch. Yeah, and I think you can even make the argument maybe it isn't a watch. Do you yeah. need to be well, over? Because they day? never actually even call it a watch, right? Yeah. And I think, think it's, it's a connected literature. accessory. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's what it is. It's like it's a smartphone extension that just happens to live on your arm. Um, right. And I, I think that's where some of this is really interesting in that you know, everyone is is flocking towards the things that we know, right? Yeah. The watch, the glasses. But, is there something else? Yeah, yeah, we don't have to be confined by that. Um, anyways, I know we're running out of time. Uh, this is like a super short episode, <laughs> but we got to run to another meeting. Um, so I want to thank you guys for watching. Um, and you know, to the folks here that, that came by to watch, thank you guys as well. Um, and thanks to Intel Mobile and Intel Studios for, for giving us the space and like putting together this insane production to, so we can do this. Um, so we'll, we'll talk to you guys real soon. Thanks.